history discussion of uh, publishing. Um, there's clearly there's clearly overlap between the different categories we, we came up with, um, but it seemed to us to make sense to have a, a separate discussion about about academic publishing, which which really follows its own course in a way. It's less it's less directed by um, uh, commercial imperatives, more in a sense by by academic imperatives and academic academic trends and and the nature of the the academy so we thought it would be really interesting to to focus specifically on that and and as with with all the other panels we've been tremendously fortunate um, in gathering together a really knowledgeable and distinguished group of speakers so uh, we we have with us um, today, um, Kenetta Hammond-Perry, who is director of the Stephen Lawrence Research Center at De Montfort University. Um, before then, uh, Kenetta was at the University of East Carolina in uh, the USA, and she is the author of London is the Place for Me, Black Britain Citizenship and the Politics of Race, which was published by OUP in, I think, 2016. Um, and uh, Kaneta will maybe be able to tell us something about her, you know, her ongoing work and, and forthcoming publications as well. Um, we have two separate speakers from uh, the Routledge, Taylor and Francis group. Um, and, and anyone knows who knows anything about journal publishing in uh, in, um, in the sort of the academic sphere, particularly in the humanities, we'll know how important and influential Telegram Francis are in terms of the range of publications uh, that they, uh, they operate. So we have uh, Geraldine Richards, who is the Routledge, who manages the Routledge Humanities portfolio, and Helen Gilmore, um, who manages the history journals list. And I uh, know Helen, deal with Helen as, as a, a Routledge, uh, Taylor and Francis journal editor like myself. Um, so it's great to have them uh, on, on the panel. Um, one other person who um, would very much have liked to have joined us in, in person, um, but wasn't able to make, make the times. And so, Miranda has uh, conducted an interview with her. Is Alison Wellsby, who is the editorial director at Liverpool University Press. And uh, as I say that, Miranda has, has appeared, and I think we'll be able to um, play as the, the interview, which is how we will start this, this session. Hello. Yeah, sorry. I'll just, I'll just keep you on your toes, Philip. Just so yeah, I know. I, I knew it would work if I started talking. So yeah. I, I, I think I'd be, I wasn't ho co a co-host, so that's, I was, I could hear and see you, but, right. but you couldn't see me. It's probably how most people would like okay. to see me. But anyway, yeah. I um, will just find Alison's video. I had a, a nice chat with her earlier, and she's also, uh, she has also very kindly, um, sent me some some materials as well of her advice about how to get published. They do have an open submissions policy at, at Liverpool University Press, uh, but we mentioned that in the video. So um, yes, but if anyone in particular wants that, that those her her documents, let me know and I, I could, I'll, I'll share them somehow during the thing. So, right, here we go. Can can you all see that? Never yeah, that, that, that's great. Yeah, right. Yeah. Here we go. Hello, Alison. Um, it's great to talk to you for uh, the What's Happening in Black British History Books event. I'm really sorry you can't join us on the day, but thank you so much for agreeing to chat to us uh, now. So, so yes, yeah, so you tell us a bit about yourself. Um, well, my name is um, Alison Wellsby. I'm the editorial director at Liverpool University Press. I've been here for about 13 years prior to that. 
I was the commissioning editor at Manchester University Press. So basically, I've been commissioning books in history uh, for over 20 years now. <laughs> Our audience might might know uh, one of the recent Black British History books you published, which was uh, Britain's Black Past, edited by Gretchen Gazina. Could you tell us yes. a bit about how that came to pass? Sure. So, well, um, these books take a, a longer, much longer time than people realise. <laughs> and we actually, Gretchen uh, uh, contacted me because she'd been recommended uh, LUP by a previous LUP author, uh, Professor Alan Rice. So we published his book, Creating Memorials, uh, Building Identities. And, um, and he was part of the whole Radio 4 series uh, that, that was the, the origin of the actual publication. And it was Alan that recommended Liverpool University Press. So um, Gretchen contacted me. That was back in 2017. He went through the normal peer review process. I was delighted to, to hear from her. It was instantly like, this is fantastic. Um, so that was great. So I went through the normal peer review, contracted by about early 2018 and then published 2020. So quite a lot of books they take uh, they take a few years or two or three years to to from initial conversation to to publication. Have you published any other Black British history books in your time? Oh yes, lots. <laughs> Um, we published uh, obviously Alan's book I mentioned. We published uh, John Belchin's book before the Windrush, looking at race relations in Liverpool. A number of books by uh, Ray Costello. He's one of the contributors in uh, Gretchen's book. Black Thought looks at British seafarers of African descent. Black Thomas Thomas looks at uh, British soldiers of African descent in the First World War. So what advice would you have for, for people who, who are interested in publishing a book with you? Or, yeah, what are you doing to proactively get more Black British history books and more Black British authors published as well? Um, well, lots of things, really. I'm constantly uh, looking for people who are speaking at conferences. Um, I often, like, search through conference, like, papers and so on. Um, I can, I can, I'm proactively out engaging and trying to, to find those works. So anything that's online, I'll be like actively searching for it. Um, sometimes I might see a gap in the market and I'll think of somebody to maybe to try and write on that. But often it's what research that people are already working on that I'm looking for. And, and people do submit to us as well, which is great. There's a form people can fill in. It's Open submissions process. Yes, so um, just go to our website, uh, liverpooluniversitypress.co.uk. Um, and there, there's a proposal uh, form they can fill out. There's also guidelines on how to fill out the form. That was really important. Um, that's especially for uh, people that haven't filled out a publishing form before. It explains why we ask certain questions, why we need this amount of information. Um, it kind of explains the number of people that will look at a proposal. There'll be myself initially. There'll be a peer reviewer. They then go to the editorial advisory board. There's an internal board. So it sounds like really complicated, but it's but it's all laid out there in how in, in how it works and, and it's quite straightforward and the thing that we really um, credit ourselves at Liverpool University Press is our author care so we're always trying to you know we're always there like supporting authors through the process and any questions you know our editors are always happy to to talk to the authors about and explain the processes so yeah Great. So, I mean, I think one, one problem, you know, we've identified at, at, at events we've done in the past is is that academic books can often have really big cover prices. And so they're not this yeah. sort of the latest research isn't always accessible to everybody. Um, what, what's your take on that? And, and, you know, what can we do to make the latest scholarship more accessible? Sure. More widely? Sure, well, it's, it's on a book by book basis, basically. So something that we might consider as quite really specialised and a high academ academic, uh, quite niche in some respects, will have a library price of, say, like £90 to start with. But we do offer a paperback promise. So every book published within uh, two years will have a paperback coming out eventually, within a two to three years after initial publication. Uh, quite a lot of our books that I've actually mentioned were paperback straight from the word go. So, um, you know, perfect. Uh, Gretchen's book, uh, Ray Costello's books, even you know Alan Rice's books. So quite a few we do do as paperbacks to start with. And the other way is, of course, is open access and whether people can get the funding they need uh, to support um, an open access a digital version to be online. And we can support authors in trying to find funding for, for those kind of applications as well. And, you know, especially if they're based at an institution, we can help the institution in explaining the costs and so on involved. And paperbacks tend to be more around what 25 
pounds or yeah. 20 to 24 98 95 around that 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 price point really and have you got anything exciting in the works that we should be looking out for coming up oh yes <laughs> we have a great book coming out actually in the next couple of months Lillian Thuram's My Black Stars translated from French about um you know people in the world uh which mean that the people he aspires to you know black people so up to Barack Obama so that's a great book coming out we have a book we've raised fists and it's about the black artist movement in the US and I've just signed up a book on um the African Institute in Colwyn Bay about uh British black people in Imperial Britain so that's going to be coming out next year so there's always something from LUP coming out in this area yeah so you you can see that can you hear me yeah so yeah, yeah sorry yeah so you can you can see that Alison's very kindly shared her contact details there if anyone wants to follow up with her with a, a book proposal uh, and I'll share a link in the chat in a minute to uh, their submissions page, but I'll, I'll stop sharing now. Thank you very much indeed. That was, uh, that was really helpful. Um, so uh, can I ask uh, Kaneta to speak next and uh, just introduce herself and the, her approach to the subject? Kaneta. Sure. Um, I first just want to thank the organizers of this conference, uh, the team from what uh, what's happening now in Black, Black British history and um, as well at the School of Advanced Studies. Um, you know, in terms of, of thinking about this um, session today, I'm, I'm, my comments, my opening comments are sort of a bit of a reflection on my process in terms of publishing the book, but also I'm going to share a little bit of, um, of advice around um, approaching that process. Um, it's Kaneta's advice, so it's not the gospel or anything like that. But just some things that that, that um, have caused me to reflect in terms of thinking about my own process. So um, I'll start in 2007. Um, the initial response to London is the place for me, which was uh, eventually published by Oxford University Press uh, US. Um, the initial response to my book proposal from Oxford University Press UK was, quote, there is no market for this work. Um, this is the same year that um, of the bicentennial of commemorations of the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade and the year that Oxford published the Oxford Companion to Black British History. Um, this is a few years after Oxford had published Philip Morgan and Sean Hawkins's Black Experience and the British Empire as part of the Oxford History of the British Empire series. So I, I had a case um, you know, for why, you know, I felt like this book, uh, you know, should be published by Oxford and sort of thinking that there was an appetite um, there. So, of course, at the time I was a recent, um, you know, PhD hoping to acquire a tenure track job at the time in the US. And so receiving that email on some level at the time kind of felt like a long list of rejections that are experienced as part of the normal course of establishing a career that includes academic writing. However, I think over the years, I've thought a lot about what that message of what the message of that rejection really communicated about the power that the role of publishing has to play in gatekeeping knowledge, making uninformed, I would argue, decisions about what constitutes legitimate knowledge and arbitrating who gets to be seen as authors of, of, of that knowledge, of that kind of um, legitimate knowledge. And so, you know, from there, I just kind of want to share um, sort of three pieces of advice as a kind of early kind of provocation for us to think about um, related to book, book publishing, because I think, you know, we can talk about all sorts of different kinds of, of academic publishing. So I think my first piece of advice would be to sort of understand the structural conditions that we're navigating in publishing Black British history, particularly in the UK. I think it is, it is telling that my book, you know, had to go through Oxford University Press US um, and, and that response there. Um, but I think it speaks to a broader historical lack of institutional recognition of the field that sort of academic publishing sits within. Um, academic publishers, I know Philip said, you know, there's not necessarily the same kinds of commercial imperatives, but there is a mark, there are market imperatives that I think are still structuring that conversation about um, how academic publishing works. So academic publishers see markets in libraries. You 
university libraries. Libraries furnish books that are being taught and used as resources for teaching and learning and research within the institution. And thus the absence of Black British history in the curriculum has this ripple effect in terms of incentivizing publishers to invest in those who are doing that work. So I think, you know, it's complicated. I'm not at all sort of doing justice to that, but just sort of being aware that there are structural conditions that one is navigating so that when you receive maybe a rejection or a kind of, um, you know, sense that someone isn't recognizing or, or your work isn't legible in certain spaces, um, there's a lot going on there. And it's not necessarily about you and the value of your work um, individually, but there are structures that, that we're operating within. I think the second piece of advice um, that sort of has shaped my journey in terms of publishing is, is to constantly build and leverage your academic networks. Um, Fred Harris um, was um, the co-editor of the series that my book was published in at Oxford um, US. And I met him as a graduate student um, at a conference um, where I gave a paper based on some of the work that I was doing. And at the time he, um, you know, thought my paper was good. And so when I got my rejection, uh, one of a couple of rejections in the publication process, and I saw, I, I actually was in Barnes and Noble and came across a book that he'd recently published and realized he was a series editor. And I just reached out to him and the series that I published, and I think is really important. It, it was in global black communities. It wasn't in the history series. And so it was, a, there are a lot of works on race and politics in that series. And so it, one of the things I think that's really fascinating about thinking about how the field evolves. It's Black British history, but it's also very interdisciplinary oftentimes in terms of the ways that people approach it. And so it may allow you to, you might want to think outside of the conventional sort of history list um, there. And that was where my book found a home. Um, in terms of the academic networks as well, I think it's important to, to kind of push back against, use those networks to push back against the information gap. And I think Allison sort of spoke to that as well. Um, you know, speak to mentors and colleagues who are publishing to really understand the process. Um, you know, my dissertation advisor had a series at another press. I have a network of sort of sister scholars that I, we were all kind of publishing our first time for the same time at different presses. And so we shared a lot of information about what we were experiencing, you know, with the peer review process. Some people got early contracts, some people couldn't get contracts until the book was like almost in copy edits. Um, understanding things about permissions around sources. Um, in my book, I used some photograph, a few photographs, but I ran into tremendous issues around, um, you know, using photographic images that I just never would have anticipated in the, in the publication process. And also having conversations about marketing and, and sort of thinking about that in terms of, of some of the, the conversations to think about with, with your networks. Um, in terms of building those networks as well, one of the things I always say is I love acknowledgments of books. So, um, you know, pay attention to where the books that you're publishing um, are being published, but also look at, you can understand other people's networks oftentimes by the acknowledgments in, in academic books. We're actually quite good at giving gratitude in the acknowledgments. And you can kind of see who, who's been in conversation with who about what at different moments um, uh, in their publication process. And I think the last thing that I'll say in terms of advice is to actually think beyond the traditional conventions of academic publishing and think about how your work and your ideas can sit in different types of spaces that reach unconventional audiences. And I think that speaks to the broader conversation that the conference is having today. Um, you know, oftentimes we think that our ideas, sometimes we're trained as academics to maybe think that unless it's published at this university press and it's automatically this thing that REF is gonna understand and all of that, that's kind of the one we kind of narrow sort of the ways that our ideas can circulate. And I think um, the field of Black British history sort of its intellectual formation and the political work that it does in a, in a broader kind of social landscape kind of demands us to think beyond some of those traditional academic publishing routes. So thinking about, you know, long form essays, um, and I'm thinking a lot more about, you know, wanting to, to, uh, to exercise my chops in that area, thinking about how social media um, can be a tool to kind of think about um, publishing and shaping some of those early ideas. And one of the other things that I'm experimenting with with um, my next book project is, you know, I want to definitely sort of reach a, a much wider audience and, and imagine that audience early on. So looking at trade presses, um, trade, uh, trade divisions of academic presses, but also um, there's some really great scholarship um, that, that is coming out in the field um, that is, you know, just, you know, taking a, a, a trade route from the start. So kind of, you know, 
thinking about the ways that our academic work can um, can fit into some of those wider public publishing uh, markets. But I think that's part of the broader conversation that we're having today. So with that, I'll stop. Kenneta, that that was brilliant advice, and I, I think it 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 um it will resonate. E each of those three points will resonate tremendously, I think, with the, with the experiences of a lot of people throughout the, their careers. Um, so, and I, I'm going to shamelessly take advantage of my position as chair and say on that third point about thinking beyond the conventional academic um, monograph or, or article, if, if people here have work that they think has policy relevance, historical research, one of my other hats at the moment is I've just taken over a, a project called History and Policy, which has run for about 20 years. And we publish um, short policy papers up to 4,000 words, blog articles. I'll put the, the website, the link to the website in the, in the chat stream. But again, if you, if you want to try and you know, speak directly to policymakers or through our networks, please please get in touch. But, but brilliant advice. Thank you so much. I'm going to pass on to, to Geraldine next to make some opening remarks. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me on this panel. Um, I am very excited to be a part of this, and I hope that I can um, just share after Kaneta's brilliant statements, which I definitely echo as someone who's given how to get published sessions in the past um, from a publisher's point of view. So I'm here based in the US and I work alongside Helen who um, we're kind of co-presenting here. And I work on Routledge history journals um, and I also manage a portfolio of art and design journals. Um, so, and in addition to this, I'm a part of Routledge's diversity, equity, and inclusion working group. Um, so we're a group within our editorial department focused this year on providing resources and guidance to colleagues to support related efforts in our journals and with our society partners. Um, so in particular, I wanna highlight a few prizes I've come across um, to support Black, minority, ethnic, BAME uh, scholars, along with early career researchers um, based in the UK. So this isn't a comprehensive list, just some things that I want to highlight. So first, there is a joint scheme to support BME history in the UK. This is a collaboration with the Social History Society and several other groups. Um, this joint scheme provides small grants to support activities and events run by BME historians working in the UK or to support events and activities exploring histories of BME people. Um, the journal Cultural and Social History is one of Routledge's journals, and it's the journal of the Society for so uh, the Social History Society. Um, the Institute for Historical Research, they have an annual Olivet O'Teal Prize for the best paper submitted to the History Lab Postgraduate Research Seminar by a Black PhD research student based in the UK. And the Royal Historical Society has an annual Martin Lynn Scholarship Award um, to assist postgraduate research of African history. Um, and I can also link um, these prizes in the chat once I'm done. Um, so two uh, current career, early career res research prizes from Routledge journals um, that might be applicable are the London Journal um, and Atlantic Studies. Um, and then finally, Helen will speak more to this, but um, the journal Wasafiri, um, they have an early career researcher prize and the journal American 19th Century History from the Association of British American 19th Century Historians. Um, they also have a prize. So our DEI working group, um, we've identified a number of journal measures that can be taken forward to expand within diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. Um, some examples include introducing prizes, as I mentioned, um, special issues, and 
expanding the authors, the readers, and the editors, and the editorial boards, like who's making the decisions, um, as mentioned, uh, around publishing gatekeeping. So, you know, with the past year and the past few years, this has become very an emerging topic. Um, I don't want to say emerging, but um, more highlighted, a lot of attention is being given to this. So this year, we want to support our editors, our journals um, to make, you know, su substantial efforts. So um, I think that's where I'll stop and hand it back to Phil or um, to Helen. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I think Gemma's already put some of those um, links to some of the things that uh, John was talking about there. Um, so uh, let me uh, finally hand on to, to Helen. Um, welcome. Thanks, Philip. Yeah, so hi, everyone. Um, my name is Helen Gilmore, and I'm one of the portfolio managers working on our history list alongside Geraldine. Um, my list tends to specialise on social, cultural and international history. Um, I joined Routledge in 2017 after graduating with an MA in literature and I first worked as an editorial assistant on sort of the wider history list um, before taking up the role as portf of portfolio manager about two and a half years ago. Um, thank you so much again for inviting me to speak today. Really, really pleased to be with you. Um, I was just going to talk briefly about how Black history features in our existing um, history and humanities portfolios, as well as building upon some of the things, some of the things that Geraldine mentioned about um, how to draw in more content on the subject area. So um, Black history, I think, is something that has always featured quite prevalently in our portfolios, but it's starting uh, to feature more and more. Um, over the years I've been working on TNS History List, as I said, we've been publishing more and more on this topic, both in our specialist titles and our more sort of broader generalist history titles. Um, a recent example of this is the Commonwealth Wargraves Commission Review into Historical Inequalities in, commemor in Commemoration, which has been in the media quite a lot recently. Um, this report actually cited several uh, articles from across the Routledge, Humanities and Social Science portfolio. Um, so, for example, the London Journal, uh, First World War Studies, Journal of War and Culture Studies, uh, Interventions and Immigrants and Minorities. Um, other examples of history journals publishing more on this topic are uh, Contemporary British History, Cultural and Social History, Women's History Review and Journal of Imperial and Commonwealth History, um, just to name a few. Uh, thinking kind of beyond our immediate history portfolio, I think what Kaneta was saying about interdisciplinarity is really, really crucial here. Um, we're kind of really proud to publish some of the forerunners of post-colonial research literature. Um, so for example, Interventions, which I mentioned previously, uh, Journal of Post-Colonial Writing and Wasafiri, as well as some more specialist journals such as The Black Scholar and Souls, a journal of black politics, culture and society. Um, as well as this, I think it's fair to say that our journals are starting to do more than ever to support the growth of black history in a variety of ways. The special issues that Geraldine mentioned are a really fantastic way to do this. And citing a recent example, um, the journal Shakespeare recently published a brilliant special issue on Shakespeare, race and nation, uh, which is guest edited by Karim Cooper and Owen Price. Um, the entire issue is free to access on the journal's website for anyone who wants to go and take a look. Um, and specialist journal prizes, like Geraldine mentioned, are also a great way to do this. So the journal Wasafiri um, launched a new prize for early career researchers this year for the best essay on international literature. And um, one of our partner societies, like Geraldine mentioned, the Association of British American 19th Century Historians, have also recently launched the Harriet Tubman Essay Prize for the best undergraduate essay or research project by Black, Asian or other minority ethnic students in the UK. And I think that's it for me for now. Great, thank you very much indeed. Um, okay, the the chat uh, function is open. Please um, do post questions uh, through the the, the chat. Um, but as uh, until I get a few, I'll start to feed in my own questions because I, I've got <laughs> quite a lot after after all of that. that there's one thing that I, I think all all three panelists a very well placed to comment on is 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 a difference between publishing in this area in the states and in in britain i mean uh Kinetic's opening comments suggested that probably was is is the uk playing catch up really 
uh, rather belatedly um, with, with things that have been happening in the States for a long time. It, it, are there sort of distinct academic cultures in, in the US and Great Britain, insofar as um, black history is concerned? Um, Kaneta, what would you what would you say about that? Um, yeah, I think it, 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 there's a different historical trajectory, yeah. and I think you know the 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 way that the institutionalization of Black Studies more generally um, has happened in the context of, of the U.S. I think um, you know matters, um, and I think you know like for instance, my dissertation advisor was Darlene Clark Hine, and sort of sort of one of the things again, like you know, if you think about how many series editors. Um, you know, of, of, you know, one of the things that she did in terms of building her own academic career was once she got her tenure track job and her book and sort of all those sorts of things, she sort of fought to have, you know, folks that were doing Af uh, African American um, history and, and Black studies um, at the helm of, of being a part of the editorial apparatus within the, the press with some of those series. And so I think, you know, again, I think about my own, um, you know, experience at Oxford, it wasn't necessarily going by way of like going to the website and, you know, downloading the forms and following all those steps. It was about, you know, leveraging someone in the field of, of Black studies who could, you know, I had already sort of translated the type of work that I was doing because we were in another, had been in other academic spaces before. And so I think, you know, there's just a different trajectory. I, I hate to always sort of, you know, make it like one is more progressive or further along the journey than another. I just think it's a, it's, it's, it's a very different historical um, trajectory. And I think there's a lot about the ways in which, particularly in terms of the realms of academic publishing, how sort of the, the field itself is reflected in the academy um, place, you know, it, it's sort of, there's a conversation happening between both arenas. Um, that, that's just sort of my, my sense of, of the, the dynamics there. Thanks so much. Ge Geraldine, what's, what's your view? I do agree. Um, I, so I, there are, like I, I studied African American studies um, here in the U.S. and I am here in the U.S., so I feel um, like I'm, I'm more aware of kind of the breadth of knowledge of Black history and um, Black studies based here in in the U.S. Um, but I do see so many emerging topics, as Helen mentioned, the recent special issue from Shakespeare. There are um, you know, the journal Cultural Studies, we have the journal Ethnic and Racial Studies that I think has a very high UK base um, and is based in the UK. Um, and with journals, it's, my experience has only been within academic journals, um, but, and we're pulling readers and authors from all over. Um, but I do, yeah, I, I would say that I, I think there might be a lean towards the US for the majority of these topics. Thank you. Hel Helen. Yeah, no, I think I agree with Geraldine. It's difficult for me to comment on this one because the majority of my journals that I manage are kind of UK based. So I've kind of got that perspective. Um, I think um, what Geraldine was saying about the global readership is really, really important. Like while a lot of our journals are kind of UK based with UK editors, we have a really, really diverse global readership from across the globe, from both the US, UK um, and beyond. So I think that's definitely something that we're starting to see much more of. Um, I think those, those patterns are becoming, becoming much more diverse. Thank you. There's one, there's, a, there's an issue which I don't think anyone has quite touched on specifically yet, and, and it's very, I mean, it's very central to academic publishing, which is the whole issue of peer review. Um, um, now, that's, that's often seen as a, you, you know, that's the litmus test of, of what is good, what is, what is rejected in, in the academic publishing world. And a, an awful lot hangs on that. I, I mean, two things, firstly, we find at my journal, it's increasingly difficult to get peer reviews because it's not it's not really rewarded in the in the academy. Um, but there's also a kind of there's also danger with peer review of a sort of groupthink, if you like, 
that people tend to maybe uh, uh, be more sympathetic to work that is like their own. So when one's trying to chart new areas, peer review can be an obstacle as well as a, a virtue. I wonder if anyone would like to, to comment on that. Um, Joe, I would like yeah. to, yeah. So this is definitely one area that we're looking at as one of the measures for the journals in the diversity, equity, inclusion, DEI um, object uh, focus this year is who's making the decision. So um, one idea is expanding editor roles. Um, you know, many journals have one or two editors. Um, we're looking at how can we add more voices to that, um, whether that's multiple editors or multiple associate editors, regional editors, so that when researchers are looking for journals to publish their work in, and they're looking at editorial boards, they're not feeling maybe that tension of not seeing any name they recognize um, or are familiar with or who they feel like their uh, research would be valued by. And those editorial board members and editors can introduce um, more expansive reviewer pools. And so we're also looking at ways to improve reviewer guidelines um, and expectations. I know some editors use their editorial board meetings to set the standard of what um, peer review should look like and um, change kind of that gatekeeping, some of the negative experiences I know researchers have had in the past. Thanks. Helen, would you, would you like to come in on this? Yes, sure. No, I think that's a, that's a really excellent point. We've been doing a lot of work around editorial board diversification because a lot of editors do use their boards for peer review, which is um, a good thing because, you know, it really, um, when you're struggling to get peer review to, to rely on the board is a pretty sort of standard practice. And so... Um, Yes, that's something that we're definitely doing. Something um, that came up in a board meeting of mine a few months ago actually was the idea of um, sort of that makes sense. So we'll have sort of like one reviewer who's really knowledgeable in that field and one reviewer who perhaps isn't as knowledgeable in that field but knows sort of certain areas of it. And so really broadening it out in that sense is something that I think is really interesting, sort of having a specific peer review. That more general peer reviewer might be quite. Breaking up a little bit, Helen, but. Oh, sorry, hang on, I might try and reset my connection. Yeah, okay, K Kineta, would you, like to, would, you, would you like to come in? And I mean, maybe if you, um, if you feel able to sort of say this, what, what's been your own experience of peer review, both as a, as, as someone who's received reviews of your work and someone who's been asked to do it? Sure, um, I think I'll, I'll, I guess we'll first <laughs> reflect on um, my first journal peer review process. Um, yeah. I got six readers reports um, back for a journal article. And yeah. ultimately, you know, this is sort of my first time around the pen and I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, I think what it was, was I think there was, they didn't know where to place it. Like they didn't know, you know, it was like, should, you know, a kind of traditional modern British historian read this? Should people in African-American history um, read um, this work? Um, it was it was sort of a mix of, and, and to be honest, um, I think it was really what I was trying to do is essentially actually create work that actually speaks to the ways in which we need to think across these different literatures that are often disparate. So it reflected that, but you know, in the peer review process, it was just kind of like, where do you go? And you could tell that like, you know, some of the readers were very much like, 
historians, uh, African American historians, or people in in Black studies, particularly I think in the U.S. And then I had like modern British historians that might do work on sort of empire. Um, and but trying to kind of make sense of that that was a definitely sort of a challenging process. But it, I think it also kind of reflected like at the editorial level, it's like we not we're not quite sure you know where where this sits. So that was definitely a challenge. I think on the flip side, in terms of being um, being a peer reviewer, I, I do think, you know, it's, it's, um, I, and I'll just sort of, you know, use my own experience. I, I find it very hard to just, you know, completely like reject it. I actually don't know how people arrive at like completely just rejecting something. I think it, it is, a, you know, it, it is, can be labor intensive to kind of think, but I do think, you know, as, as the collegial thing to do is about sort of really, um, taking the time to to kind of think through how to get a person, um, you know, where that work is something that maybe might be useful to you. And to, to also, I think it's the challenge can be as well as like suspending your own projections about what what a particular piece should and, and could be doing. So I think it's it's a challenge. I think that's that's um, I, I'm just welcome everything that um, has been said on the panel already about how publishers are thinking about that process, because I do think the ways that that is managed becomes um, a part of the way that that a lot of the kind of unintentional gatekeeping um, happens because there's not any thought about that kind of peer review beyond we we're going to pick two names that we know have published tangentially in that area and kind of not thinking about what the expectations are. So I think as a peer reviewer, um, I also think, you know, would welcome some of that guidance because I've kind of, you kind of don't really get it. You know, oftentimes people sort of send it to you and it's just sort of this assumption of, is this something you'd be interested in as opposed to really kind of asking some of the questions about, you know, this is, you know, as an organization, as a press, this is, you know, what, what we want to give for people, give back to people who are choosing us to send their, their work to. So I think that's really fantastic to hear about, um, you know, the, re the reflections on that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And I just um, remind people to, to pose questions of your own uh, using the, the chat function. Um, I mean, can I, say, I think it comes back to what you said about networks and how important networks are. And, and the, the, the weird thing about, about academia still is that it so much, you know, to keep things going relies so much on good goodwill one way or another. I mean, actually being a good citizen, um, knowing you've got lots of different things on, but still agreeing to do that peer review. And, um, uh, and it's why the kind of, you know, the sort of marketization of higher education never quite works because it, it kind of completely ignores that area. Um, I mean, one, one other area, which I think is becoming increasingly difficult in, in academic publishing is, is getting book reviews for um, journals. Now that's something, okay, a peer review, you can, you can knock it off in, uh, in an afternoon, maybe if you, work, if you work quite hard and you know the stuff. I mean, a book review is quite a big chunk of your time. And again, you don't really get much professional credit for it. And yet, you know, um, for, for most academic monographs, the only place they're ever going to get reviewed is in is in an academic journal. Um, so, do do people find that that is an that is an issue as well? I mean, Helen um, Geraldine with the Taylor and Francis journals. Yeah, it's a it's a good point. I mean, we tend to sort of encourage early career researchers to, to do book reviews because I find yeah. that quite a nice sort of entry point into kind of the world of publishing and getting published. And I think it really helps to kind of to get to get their name out there. But I agree, I mean, I think it is kind of it's quite siloed in the sense that it's a very, very insular system in that these kind of books are being published by publishers and reviewed by journals and publishers. And so I think that there is potentially more that could be done to, to widen that out. Yeah. 
Yeah, I agree with Helen. Um, we have journals that are dedicated solely to, to book reviews and there's such an important function of the field and for the readers of the journals and for the authors of the books that are being reviewed. Um, Kaneta mentioned maybe using more social media and that is something that we do encourage authors to do with their books, um, also with their journal articles is you know, reaching out to publishers to get to be reviewed, but also to just share, you know, that they've they've put their work out there, what it's about um, in those, you know, 280 characters or in short form um, blog posts. So, you know, they're um, kind of encouraging that awareness of their work as well. I mean, I suppose, it, sorry, yeah, Helen. Sorry, and I was just going to add to that that we um, offer all of our authors 50 free e-prints for their work. So if they share those on social media, then you know the first 50 people that click on that link will get free access to it and can read it, you know, for free. So that's a really sort of useful tool that I think you know people should utilize. Yeah, yeah. I mean that I think that um, I, I suppose a, a gripe on the part of some academics is that they sometimes feel that the the academic presses don't get enough don't do enough to get books reviewed in the mainstream press, that it, it's always the kind of the big blockbuster books. Is, that, is it just impossible to, to get academic books reviewed in, in sort of mainstream newspapers, magazines? What, what sort of efforts do you make uh, at, at Routledge to try and get, get that kind of crossover? I mean, Helen, maybe again. Yeah, this is a difficult one for me to answer, to be honest, because I think our books colleagues tend to, to manage yeah, yeah. the yeah. process, so it's tricky. I mean, I will say that um, there doesn't tend to be that much crossover in terms of academic and sort of common interest. That seems to be, that's, that's sort of like, you know, that sweet spot where it, it appeals kind of both markets. And I think it's... Yeah. Um, it is quite rare for for a book to kind of to sit in that spot so in that respect it is it is quite difficult but yeah sorry no it's not, not much more that I can can really add to that I'm afraid and I, yeah I suppose that um, it, uh, the other frustration I suppose for academics is that um, they feel that they're not asked to review um, books in more mainstream publications. Um, I mean, Kaneta, do you, do you now get asked to, to do lots of book reviews because of your, your expertise? Um, yeah, I've d I, don't, I don't think I've, uh, well, I'll take that back. I've been um, you know, asked to do a couple, I think, in, in more um, mainstream, but not, that's not something that I've, I've done a lot of. I think to your point about, um, you know, the labor intensiveness of a, of a really good book yeah. review is, is, you know, does require, I think, a, another kind of level. I think, you know, one question I'd love to just kind of pose back to the, to the room and mm. is, I guess I'm wondering whether or not the traditional academic book review, like, what is its shelf life at this point? Because there's so many ways, I think about, like, the Surviving Society podcast is actually one of my main places where I sort of find out what's going on in terms of um, kind of broader um, sort of sociological literature and, and, and sometimes oftentimes kind of historically informed literature. And sometimes it's, it's or the Black Perspective blog where, you know, a new book is dropping and there's a kind of, you know, dialogue um, between the author and, you know, a member of, of that team. And I think there are just so many other, um, and I think about how like, you know, oftentimes in teaching, you know, when you're kind of getting students to understand and situate a book in a, in a debate, you might recommend them to like read the book first, but also um, to, to also pay attention to the reviews. But I think it's just much wider network of, of sort of options to kind of understand a conversation around a book now in a way that I feel like the traditional book review wouldn't necessarily be the first port of call um, for in, in the same way. Um, and, and I guess, and I'm just curious about what others kind of think about that. And I mean, I think, you know, even when I'm, I'm noticing more presses kind of having blog posts around the book, even journal articles yeah. uh, are, are, are having the kind of blog post that's kind of like, okay, here's the extended abstract about what the big ideas that are, that are present there. And I think, 
I just kind of wonder what people think about like, you know, whether, you know, just the kind of conventional book review and, and how it can continue to kind of to live. I, I don't think it's like just been become a total dinosaur, but um, I'm just kind of wondering um, what, how, how it can kind of maintain a kind of utility in this wider landscape where you can kind of get a, an impression of a book or and a really informed kind of um, scholarly impression of a book just in different ways through through different kinds of media that exist around and, and existing around academic trade you know books not not just um, yeah. more trade books well maybe maybe feed that back to to, to Helen and Geraldine I mean what do you do to try and get academic articles in your journals noticed more generally by by the media by in other ways I mean, uh, have you gone down this route of blogs or what are you trying at the moment Jody, yeah. Well, yeah there's uh, a couple of things and it varies uh, journal by journal so there are journals that have a dedicated blog where they will take um, the academic article and reposition it in a way that's blog friendly and then link to the main article. Um, they have active Twitter presences um, where they engage, they're using hashtags, they're in the conversation. And from there, we kind of support in any way that we can. Um, I know I, I have, not that it's great, but my own Twitter. So I'll try to amplify the voices that are coming across of the journals I work on. Um, I think um, special issues, like not to diver divert too much, but I think special issues can be a great way of yeah. having like a nice package to promote. And that kind of really gets the conversation going for a, an extended period of time. Um, one example from a journal that I work on in the arts, um, they had a special issue on blackness that published at the end of last year and in blackness and contemporary art. And they're continuing that conversation through this year until the next special issue on whiteness in contemporary art um, kind of comes out. And there's been a lot of traction around that. Um, but yeah, I think those are just kind of some ideas. The idea around, I agree that book reviews aren't necessarily kind of going out the window today or tomorrow, um, but there are new ways to kind of share that information with podcasts, um, with audio pieces, and that are that are just more accessible and easier to, to attain. Thank you very much. Helen, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, sure. No, I think that they're all really, really good points. Definitely agree with them. I think the one thing I would add is that we're encouraging kind of more and more journal editors and journals to adopt social media themselves because um, they kind of really can get into those, into those networks that potentially that we couldn't and they know sort of like who to follow and who are sort of key influences in those areas and they can sort of, uh, you know, really help to, to amplify things further. And then just also that, you know, if, if, if subjects are topical or trending, then we make these articles free to access as kind of a matter of course and you know that that's part of the battle really and kind of getting them getting them out there and getting them read yeah when you touch on a, a a question which has come in from a couple of people about about the price of academic outputs mm -hmm. so i suppose people tend to think about these these academic monographs which will retail for a hundred pounds or or more uh which, which clearly restricts the the distribution. I mean, there's been a debate going on for, for years now about the utility of open access publishing so far as journal articles are concerned. And I mean, now, if you have a piece of research funded by the research councils, they insist that you, you make it available by, by open access. Um, but it, they're clearly bigger problems for open access publishing of monographs. So, I mean, is, is open access the way forward or does it bring with it its own problems in terms of reaching out to wider audiences? Helen, do you want to take that up? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I think that 
for books, open access is an is quite a sort of emerging area. It hasn't really been that prevalent for very long, but in journals, we, we've been doing open access for uh, quite a significant length of time. I mean, um, up until now, open access tend to be really, really prevalent in sort of science, engineering and medicine titles because the funding is there. That's kind of the, the yeah. bottom line, really. So um, at TNF, we've got a lot of um, STM titles that are purely open access. They publish only open access pieces um, on that basis. Whereas in the humanities, we tend to operate on kind of more of a hybrid model in that we'll publish some open access pieces and some pieces that are behind the kind of subscription paywall. And I think until now, the humanities have kind of been, been playing catch up in to the STM subjects in that respect, because um, it's just been a much, much slower um, thing to develop. But I mean, I think that this year definitely we are going to be seeing quite a definitive swing towards open access in the humanities. So Taylor and Francis recently signed um, a transformative arrangement with JISC, which represents UK institutions, meaning that uh, researchers from UK institutions can publish open access free of charge in our journals from this year. And there are several other sort of these transformative arrangements going on. So I think that the landscape this year, particularly in the next couple of years, is really changing and it's going to be really interesting to see the impact of that. Thank, thanks so much. Um, Kaneta, I mean, you want, have you had um, much experience of the issue of open access and, and the price? Is it, do you think it's price which is, is restricting the distribution of academic literature in this field, or is it the way it's written? It's what's, what, what do you feel about this? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> I, it's funny. I'm. I'm still. I feel like I'm still wrapping my head around some of the open access yeah, uh, debates because yeah. I do feel like it's it it I, I really it was just new to me until I, I moved to the UK. Um, in terms of just the, the I guess the urgency of some of these questions around mm -hmm. open access. Um, and I see. I think I also I see it sort of from a lot of different um trajectories. I do think you know thinking about exorbitant price, thinking about, you know, trying to get academic books, you know, if there is going to be a cost attached to the price point of going to kind of academic book sections in water, Waterstones or major, you know, kind of, if, if we could sort of, I could sort of see that, but when they become so absorbent that the only only people who are going to be able to buy them are, are libraries, not even the academics themselves who write them can oftentimes afford some of the price points that exist around academic texts. And I, I just think that is an, an absolute, you know, real just shame um, uh, to, to, to think about. So I think that's that can be just a barrier on so many levels. I mean, in, in terms of thinking about would you assign it, um, the kind of assigning of books kind of happens differently um, in different contexts. But like, you know, I know even back in the US where there was a real expectation where, you know, students bought every book on the graduate list. I would, if, if a price point for a book or there was no paperback, I don't care how great or groundbreaking the work was, I wasn't going to assign it or what I wasn't going to make it a required, you know, reading for that course, I would try to find another way, um, another way in. And so I think that that's, um, you know, definitely a challenge. I, I know that um, I don't mean to like take on chair responsibilities, but I, I, I see Miranda's question about like how to actually get you know, academic work in in schools and to make mm. it kind of, you know, accessible to an audience that that might not be imagining um, itself connected to the university or sort of fulfilling the educational goals of the university. And I think particularly for Black British history, um, you know, I think there is, you know, a real responsibility um, and kind of an, an ethical responsibility to kind of think about um, some of some of the ways in which um, the urgency of that work is is needed far and beyond and and wider than than the realms of of the university. So I don't I definitely don't have a definitive answer yeah. on that. But I mean, here's 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 the here's the thing that I I've been sort of slightly out of the loop so far as teaching is concerned over the last decade or, or so since I moved to to SAS um, and and doing more research facilitation stuff. But I I know anecdotally from, from, from my friends and, and, and relations who do a lot of teaching now, that even if, even if a book is available, a sort of standard academic monograph is available in the library in digital form, free on open access, 
sometimes they, they find it difficult to get students to actually use them because they, they're so used now to, to kind of taking information off the web, you know, finding these kind of bite-sized pieces of, of information. Um, and so do we need to kind of, in, in a way, not, not just sort of make the existing books available, but re really rethink how we kind of pack package our work to reach different audiences. I think that's interesting. We're starting to experiment yeah. a lot more with journal articles. So we're doing much more with yeah. like multimedia now. So yeah. We've had a few kind of like video articles and even in, I think it was a marketing, business and marketing title, we published an entire video issue, yeah. which yeah. I think is really, really interesting. And we're doing kind of more in terms of using sound and music and using sort of photographs and 3D images and, and that kind of stuff. So it is a really sort of changing landscape and um, mm. it's still kind of early days in that respect. But I yeah. think that as this kind of desire for a new way of looking at things takes off, we are going to be doing more of this kind of stuff. Geraldine, do you want to come in here? Yeah, definitely. I agree with Helen. Um, I've worked on some of these titles that have used multimedia recently. And I think that is one of the benefits of open access as it's all digital. You mm. can do more with the content and present it in new ways um, that just offers different like learning opportunities. So. Um, it's really exciting to see, and I'm excited to see. And I think it also gives new opportunities for researchers who want to present their information in different ways, um, and or who might have not realized that they could present their information in different ways. And it's um, you know expands their their scope as well. So the, thank you very much. The the um, the couple of further questions in in chat. Well, one is sort of behind the scenes. Um, do academic publishers practically seek authors to write particular books? Uh, if so, what are some of the criteria uh, by which uh, they judge, decide the author's competence, authority? So secrets of the trade, um, Helen, Geraldine. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's difficult to comment in its entirety because of myself and Geraldine work in our journals division. Right? Yeah. I think it's a combination of the two. I think that our sort of commissioning editors will look at, see if there's any kind of like hot topics that are being discussed a lot. And if, you know, that things emerge and they will kind of seek people out to, to write things. Other than that, you have an open submissions policy as well. And, you know, authors will submit proposals to our editors. I mean, does that, does that tally, Geraldine, or am I completely making things up? No, that's, that's true. Um, I, I'm thinking of one uh, history editor right now who's commissioning, particularly in like Latin American history. And so she'll kind of scan um, conferences and the, um, the programs to see who's presenting on that and will reach out directly, but her, her email and um, is completely open for accepting um, those sorts of proposals as well. So I think it's a mixed bag. Um, and then with book, going back to, to kind of journal articles and book reviews, I think that can be a great way for commissioning editors to see like what's coming out from different presses um, and maybe fill in the gaps um, and find reviewers um, in the book process as well. Thank you very much indeed. So there's a, another question here. Is there a role for organizations like the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, the Institute of Historical Research, uh, to broker relationships between academics and teachers? I mean, those, the, those were um, references to uh, some of our organizations, but I mean, Kineta, the Stephen Lawrence Research Center, I guess as well, you're thinking about how to, how to disseminate academic expertise and research to a wider audience. How, how do you go about it? And what, what partnerships do you think could help disseminate this work? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, we have a, we're kind of in the early, obviously we're a new center, but we're in the early stages of launching um, a, 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 an agenda that's called Teaching to Transform. And we're kind of just doing a lot of really Lester's are kind of 
laboratory in certain ways to think about different ways um, that the university sort of is invested in the local education landscape. And um, part of that work is about, you know, we're doing things around sort of anti-racist pedagogies, but one of the things that we're also doing in terms of some of the research projects that our team is taking on is trying to see, you know, join those research projects up with, from the start, um, a kind of connection to being able to think about, um, you know, how some of that research can be translated into the secondary education environment, particularly in Leicester. There are a lot of projects that we're generating um, within the center that are really focused on trying to sort of think regionally about racial formation historically in the UK. And we think that that particular research, um, you know, in thinking about like transforming, you know, the curriculum and thinking about some of the things that a number of organizations, um, Runnymede and all different sorts of campaigns have been um, sort of focused on thinking differently about the role of Black history in, in the curriculum. Um, but we're trying to kind of, you know, create uh, some, some ways of kind of thinking about how to join those up. And so with particularly some of those project research projects um, that have a Lester focus, like for instance, one of my colleagues is leading um, work that's looking um, at the, the Caribbean carnival um, in in Leicester and as part of some of the, the suite of that work, we're hoping to be able to, you know, as part of the classroom takeovers that are part of our teaching to transform project, be able to introduce um, some of that research and also to be able to work with teachers to help them to think about how, what it means to introduce um, some of that work. So thinking about the work itself and the, the substance of the research, but also thinking about, you know, what it means politically and also, um, you know, in terms of pedagogy to introduce some of these um, topics into the curriculum. So those are just some of the ways that, that we're trying to kind of bridge um, some of those um, artificial divides between um, academic education and learning and research and and also kind of joining it up with teachers. And I think the other thing too as a research center is that, you know, I always sort of talk about, you know, our kind of dream of what we're working towards is really to think about intergenerational research community. So how can we also have projects and pilot things in our in our local schools where we actually encourage students to be a part of the research process um, and how that that can inform what we do um, on the academic side of, of some of those questions as well. So I think those are some of the aspirations of that larger uh, kind of program of work um, that's really focused on, again, making those connections between our center's academic research and the education landscape in, in Leicester. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. There's, there was a question in the Q&A about having access to um, unpublished doctoral theses that maybe hadn't found a publisher. And someone has uh, responded uh, by uh, providing a link to the British Library site where you can search 500,000 doctoral theses. That's, that's quite, a, quite a resource there. Um, uh, so, but uh, there's, a, there's another question um, uh, uh, I wonder whether some academic books need to be translated for a general reader. Uh, could there be some sort of ghostwriter? I feel, I feel professionally offended by the suggestion that historians don't write clearly enough. Um, but maybe there's a kind of, there's, there's something to that, that, I mean, Helen was talking about interdisciplinarity. I always have to be her saying that word. But uh, we were all told that we have to be interdisciplinary. But it strikes me that there's still, I mean, there isn't much of a dialogue between what my, one might call kind of conventional empirical historians who do the sort of work that, that I do, and I suppose most probably most people in this, in this virtual room do, and, and the kind of hardcore post-colonial theory, um, which is not really easily readable, even, you know, even by me. Um, uh, it's very, very kind of theoretical, uh, uses its own particular, um, own particular vocabulary, very technical vocabulary. Um, again, is there a sort of, I mean, it, did, Helen, you talked about this sort of interdisciplinary dialogue. Do you feel that there's much of an interdisciplinary dialogue between these, these different fields? 
Um, yeah, I think it's it's starting to kind of emerge more and more, I think. So whenever I speak to kind of journal editors for history journals specifically, a lot of the conversations kind of centre around how can we broaden out the scope? How can we sort of, you know, get into sort of cultural studies and gender studies and, and you know, all of these kind of different areas? And I think there's a lot of crossover um, generally. I think history lends itself to a lot of other different disciplines. I think it's quite, you know, malleable in that, in that sense. And so you're going to get a lot of um, topics published on history and not necessarily sort of your traditional history journal I think but definitely I think it, it it's a really emerging um emerging topic you've got sort of quite interesting sort of real cross-disciplinary things going on sort of like medical humanities and public humanities and 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 things like that that are I think on the up thanks very much uh Geraldine Canetta do you want to comment on this or should we bring this up yeah yeah Canetta uh, yeah, I, I actually, um, I, I take your point about um, kind of the, the translation piece. I mean, I, I don't, I think academic writing, um, I would have borrowed this from Gary Young. He just recently did a, a writing workshop from us and he said, there's no such thing as a general reader, right? Um, like that there, there is an audience for, for your work. Sometimes we don't think through who that audience is. Um, and, and I also sometimes I'm kind of, you know, I know some people say don't use jargon, but one person's jargon, one community's mm. jargon is like, you know, it's sort of like, so it's, it's again, that question about audience and sort of, yeah. you know, who are we in conversation with, I think is, is really important. However, I say all that, but I also do think that academic training doesn't train us to be writers, right? Um, that's, I think that's one of the other things that I'm kind of reckoning with, with the second book. I know I've written a book, but I'm, I'm you know, trying to kind of imagine a different audience for my, my second book, which is rooted in my academic research. Um, but I, I'm finding myself like taking much more time to think about the craft of writing um, in, in the context of how I communicate and how I imagine different kinds of audiences. And I don't, it's, it's, that's not something that you really learn in the, the kind of, I mean, you kind of get it out and it, there's the question about like crafting an argument and making sure you have an argument and the evidence to mm -hmm. back it up. But like, nobody actually really takes the time to kind of teach you about writing and it kind of, you kind of maybe learn on the process of publishing, but yeah. not really. Like you kind of learn by when the peer reviewer comes back to tell you that, you know, the, the argument is lost here or, you know, somebody's kind of, um, you know, you're learning on the back end, I think on the back foot oftentimes. And I, at mm. least that's my experience. And so I do find that, um, at the same time that I do think, you know, there are certain books that are meant for a very niche specialist audience and there's legitimacy um, for that. And sometimes those ideas filter down um, in, in different kinds of ways in terms of what, what kind of conversations they spur and, and show up in different spaces in, in, in academic conversations and in wider, um, wider conversations in the field. But I also do think there's something to be said about um, really thinking about how we write and, and really taking much more care um, in terms of, of our, our writing. And I, I, I don't know whose <laughs> role it is to kind of teach us that or, or anything like that. But I think that those would be just my, you know, in response to the ghost writer thing. Yeah, um, it's, it, it's, it's yeah. the more we can do as a sort of community of, of scholars to help to train people um, in, in, in that. I mean, not, not so much to, to give them skills as to give them confidence, perhaps. Because they, I mean, again, with journals, one, one's very wary of taking something from, certainly from an undergraduate or even a, someone doing a master's course, but towards the end, someone towards the end of their PhD, they'll, you really would expect them to, to try and place pieces at that, at that point and to be able to do so. And, and yet there's a kind of a, they don't often they don't know that the way they write is good enough. Um, they feel it has to be have to structure it in some very artificial way or write it in some very artificial way. So is, can we do more to sort of train people? Do you think? Can I say maybe you? Um, I, I I just I I don't know. I I think so. I mean, I think or or just maybe sort of emphasize it, and maybe that's. 
um, you know, a part of the way that we maybe even rethink. I, I think yeah. even the fact that I'm having this conversation with myself, it does show up in yeah. my supervision conversations with my PhD <laughs> students. And I'm yeah. kind of, you know, just kind of think, getting them to think about what is the story that you're trying to tell? Even some of them aren't always history students as well, but I'm just kind of like, who's at the center of, of, of what you're, you're trying to get at? Like even your methodology and like you've making it made a choice about who you want to focus on here. So like, how do we craft a kind of text that actually does due diligence to, um, you know, the, who you're trying to kind of, um, you know, be focused on or who you want your reader to, to focus on. And so, um, I'm definitely not like an expert on it, but I am thinking a lot, a lot more about it. And 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 I think it's just it's something maybe even on our professional organizations. And um, we we have kind of tried to do and infiltrate some of that within our professional development workshops for some of our early career um, scholars that are based at the center is to kind of think about long form writing, um, to think about perhaps, you know, uh, writing for a, a trade audience and and kind of thinking about how, again, your work can live in the world in different ways um, um, beyond that. And, and also kind of having the conversation about what that can look like and, and some of the thinking that might might go um, behind that. So I think it's, it's a wide ranging kind of conversation that probably sh can, should be taken up in, in many different spaces. Thank, thanks very much. There's a question here, someone um, taking me up on my suggestion that academic publishing isn't restrained by commercial dictates. I, uh, maybe I could have phrased that better, but the point, the point I think I was making was that certainly uh, uh, the pub journal publishing, publishing articles, isn't. I mean, uh, Helen has never got on the phone to me as journal, as journal editor saying, you know, you've published a, an article on medieval hand, handwriting, you know, it'll never sell. Um, you know, we, we, we decide on purely academic grounds. Um, and presumably, if you, if you charge £100 for a monograph, you, 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 it doesn't have to be wildly commercial. You're going you're gonna to make a, uh, a, 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 a modest profit on library sales. But am I, just, am I being completely naive? I mean, is, is there a kind of a commercial imperative that we're, we're not talking about here? Um, Helen and Geraldine, in terms of in terms of academic publishing, who'd like to go, Helen? No? Yeah, no, I can comment on that. I mean, I think that the journals divisions and book divi books divisions operate on kind of very different business models, and they're sort of sustained in very different ways. Um, in journals, you know, we have this kind of like hybrid model between open access and subscription. And in often cases, you know, people who have access don't realize they have access and that, you know, they can access all this journal content through their institutions and through their institutional logins. And so I think that there potentially could be more to be done to, to create awareness of that. But in, I mean, as you were saying, we, you know, we kind of um, leave our academic editors to kind of make the calls in terms of content and and the like so from our perspective yeah it's it's you know it's it's tricky and Geraldine do you have anything anything to add yeah I agree with Helen there's um greater flexibility I would say within journals publishing as it's article by article and so what the editor is wanting to publish uh, or the editorial team um, can go forth where within books um, they are there are certain criteria criteria um, and the publishing of monographs um, is an expensive endeavor um, but I don't think that should kind of limit someone in the pursuit of having a book monograph published um, like the presentation at the start you know we do a similar, you know, hardback at first, and then within, I think, about 18 months, um, you there's a more affordable paperback version, and sometimes the paperback comes out at the same time as um, the hardback version, and then there's ebooks as well. So um, I know our books division, they're kind of, they're definitely thinking of ways to make it more accessible, but we don't want to kind of gatekeep research knowledge and the publication of it. Um, it's just the cost is something to consider. 
Thank, thanks. There's, there's a question. Um, what about people outside the academy who don't have an institutional login? I mean, uh, during the, the COVID crisis, uh, you know, a number of publishers and consortia made journals uh, available free of, free of charge uh, as a kind of an emergency measure. Do, Geraldine, have you been, um, do you kind of monitor who is the sorts of people who are, who are accessing journals? You know, the proportion who seem to come from outside academic affiliations? Do, have you been, you know, do you have any data from the last year that might provide a guide for that? Speak to that. Um, I don't have direct data on folks who are outside of um, the academic institutions, yeah. but we have seen such a great increase in the readership in the past year. Um, like other publishers, we did set a lot of um, content to be free to access. Um, and then we continue to do so, not just open access content, but just things that are relevant or emerging or just important to, to us, to the editors, to the community. Um, I do work on journals that are really focused on um, like practitioner communities and wanting to include those voices in that. So also include those readers. So we're constantly making things free to access um, and letting folks know that if they need access um, to a particular piece, you know, the different ways that they can um, obtain that. Thanks very much. Helen, Helen do you want to yeah, no, that's I completely agree with all that. The only thing I was going to add was that we also have a um, supporting authors in emerging regions initiative. So anyone who's at you know um, an applicable institution, they can apply for this, and they get tokens for um, X number of free articles, and we can replenish those, you know, on a case by case basis mm -hmm. as well. So there's definitely lots that we are doing to to facilitate access to those who who may not have it through institutions. Great, thank you. I, I Lucy McKee has had her hand up and I think we'd like to come in uh, with a comment or, or question. Lucy, do you want to um, unmute yourself and ask, ask something or make a comment? Hello? Lucy, do you want to come in? Okay, drop um um uh, drop me a line via chat if you want to if you want to say something. Um, oh, either yeah. Hello, we can we can see you but not hear you. I, I sent a message to say I hadn't requested a question. Thank you. Oh right, sorry. I, I'm sorry. I may have made a mistake. No, don't don't worry. That's that's great. Um, there, there's um, Arif uh, Zaman says uh, there's a boom in international business history uh, from events, publications, activity amongst networks in recent years. To what extent are the publishers tapping into? Um, this to support more inclusive histories. So, um, Helen, uh, uh, Geraldine, do you have any any experience of sort of business history and issues of diversity around business history? I don't work on any particular business history titles. Um, and I know this is probably different, but I um, we do have a journal of kind of like media economics. And yeah. I believe they, they're taking a lot of initiatives towards um, diversity and within the general like kind of comms and media field. Um, but I'd have to look more into business history um, in particular. Okay, thanks so much. Um, yeah, I just gonna say likewise. Um, yeah. Got some 
smaller titles that kind of incorporate elements of business history, but nothing kind of specifically on, on that topic in its whole. So I'd have to have to look into that in a bit more detail. Great, thank you very much. Um, no more questions I can see unless I've, unless I've missed anything. Um, Michael, Miranda, are you, are you dying to come in and ask a question? Um, Miranda, you were talking about trying to get a publisher for Black Tudors uh, kind of earlier on in the, in the chat. Yeah, well, I was just that when Kenyatta um, started her remarks at the beginning about, you know, rejection, uh, you know, I, I just sort of was chipping in. Uh, that, yeah. Uh, you know, I think it's that, that I mean, the, I had the exact same experience, you know, even though I had an agent, he sent it out to like 30 publishers. I mean, this was for a, a trade, you know, a tr trade book. Yeah, you know, it was it was for the general reader. Uh, you know, and and you know, they were one only one person wanted to publish it, and uh, you know, when they bothered to give a, a reason, they they often rejected it on the grounds that there wasn't a market. And you know, and I think that's such a sort of often refrain. You know, not just in history books, but in Black British books altogether, in in kind of in literature and and all of that and. Yeah, but, but I mean, you get the same stuff in the film industry and TV, you know, and like, hopefully we're, we're turning the tide. But, yeah. you know, I think, um, yeah, I was just echoing that, really. Thank but I, I, also, I also had a point um, about, you know, it, it, the writing skills thing. And we, yeah, we're not taught as academic. In fact, if anything, as an academic, I was told that I was too polemic and too journalistic <laughs> in my writing style. Yeah. And I had to learn how to write like an academic. <laughs> and not make generalizations for that extensive footnotes. Anyway, I learned that for my doctorate and then I had to unlearn it again in order to, <laughs> I'm still having trouble with that. But um, yeah, uh, I mean, if you're-, if you know, you're... I think It's a different thing, you know, it, it, yeah. in my thesis, I was taking on other academics in the field. I was saying, this guy's arguing that, I disagree because of this, here are these quotes, yeah. this, like chapter and verse. And you know, most people who pick up a book you know, that, that doesn't interest them because they don't know who these three other people were. They don't care what was being argued in 1943. They just want to know the story, you know. And, and I think I do find it frustrating because a lot of academic books have got amazing stories in them. People have yeah. uncovered amazing stuff out of the archive. And, it, you know, it sits there in this £100 book that, you know, just doesn't get translated into, and I, I you know, into a format that, that you know, sort of average person uh, you know, is going to pick up and really absorb or or it's going to be made into a feature film because some of them really ought to be you know out there in the popular sphere yeah um, exactly. I do quite like the idea of a ghost writer are you know, I think <laughs> academics are, you know we all have different skills as well I mean mm -hmm. um, uh you know Robin and Abdul often talk about you know diggers pu mm. pugilists mm. choreographers you know, and the diggers are the, you know, the, those of us who just love getting into the archive and pulling yeah. stuff out with our bare hands, but we don't necessarily care, you know, we're, we're not necessarily like skilled writers, you know, it, it, there are, it, it takes all sorts, nobody's going to be like the perfect package, and yeah. I think we need to work together more, I think there's an awful lot of, um, uh, individualism in in academia and in in the field in general, uh, you know, and also, but you, you also in publishing, in that you you're trying to sell someone as an author and it's them yeah. and it has to be all them. Whereas in a lot of it is actually of, of scholarship is a collective endeavour. Mm. And so I quite like the idea of you know getting someone who writes popular nonfiction, sending them a pile of books that have been published in the field that are a hundred pounds each, you know, but and and you know you. Know, I don't know everything that's been published about Black yeah. Britain in the interwar years, in the last ten years. Giving them a pile, say, right, read all this stuff, write it up, send it to the authors to fact check it, and then get it out there for eighteen ninety nine. <laughs> <laughs> Is this a terrible idea? I don't know. Mm. We've got uh, we, we're nearly out of time. I, I noticed that Paul Spalding Mulcock has his hand up. So, Paul, would you like to come in with a just a final? comment or question <coughs> can you can you hear yeah, me yeah yeah can yeah, okay so so um i'm a features writer for a number of publications one of which is the yorkshire times right um and um 
uh, take your point. M most of our readers, I'm, I'm going to shy away from using the word general reader. I don't believe there is such a thing. Mm. But um, when we have reviewed uh, books with a strong academic bias, we've had tremendous take up, very healthy readership figures. And one of the one of the, the the patterns we're seeing at the moment, an emergent trend, if you like, is a strong interest in um, doing what Satnam Sangara has suggested, which mm. is that we go back and actually understand the narrative of empire and and, and mm. or unpick post-colonialism itself. Um, and I'm thinking books that are of an ac academic pedigree on, on that topic would be of interest to to our readership. Uh, I'll give you another example. I reviewed uh, all the sonnets of Shakespeare uh, by uh, Paul Edmondson and Professor Stanley Wells. It had enormous hit. So I'm, I'm just really positing the, the question, uh, is there a role for, for publications like ours and, and reviewers like myself to perhaps form some nexus with um, those wanting to disseminate, uh, um, particularly history, uh, I, I think less so regrettably for science and what have you, spe specifically for myself. It's not really something I feel I could I could rise to. But but histories, uh, political, that yeah. sort of stuff. Is that of potential interest? I think that's what that's what this this seminar series is trying to do, is trying to raise awareness and make make those sort of connections. But I think it, it's a very good point, Paul, about how we you know how um, the academic community communicates with with the, the media to actually let journalists and editors know what's what's out there. So I think that's an ongoing conversation. But uh, uh, it doesn't surprise me. I think it's um, you know Yorkshire Yorkshire still values culture culture and. Yeah, scholarship and right. learning that's sorry to interrupt slight misnomer although we're, we're we we use the tagline the voice of yorkshire yeah um we have over a million a million uh, yeah. readers a, a month and, and climbing um bizarrely 50 percent of those engaging with our material are not resident in the uk and the right. vast majority of them are yeah. in america bizarrely yeah, the diaspora. So it, yeah it's, well it's a <laughs> Yeah, part of that. So, so Yorkshire, yeah. it's not just yeah. it's not just us hardy Yorkshire. I mean, I'm yeah. in Brazil, but we've got a yeah. I wouldn't say global, but we've got an international reach. And, I, and I'm just as I said, I'm just expressing yeah. a strong desire on my part, and I think I'm echoing uh, an attitude that my et editor would take that we yeah. would be interested in forming that type of relationship, and on a book by book basis. Yeah. Um, getting it out there and it's another route to market you know some of those readers might be teachers they might be scholars they might be academics yeah they might just be interested parties I mean Miranda's work um, sorry to be mildly sycophantic but it's fabulous stuff and anybody could engage and love it um, so I, I just feel very enthusiastic that we, we we fly the flag a bit here and say think of organizations like ours think yeah. of people like me as uh, a bridge to further readership, further profile. That's a great point. It's a really, it's a really nice way to end this this session. Um, yeah, thanks, we, Paul. I definitely, I would definitely yeah, I mean, discuss yeah. that further. And, yeah. and uh, you know, do email me, and we we can carry on because yeah, I can send you a reading list. <laughs> no, but you know, there are so many great books coming out all the time, and you know, and, and I'm sure it would be fantastic to have you reviewing them yeah. and and. Um, Good to hear that. I mean, Yorkshire is a badge of quality around the around the world. So that's <laughs> it. We've got great, a fantastic panel, a wonderful discussion. Thank you, Kaneta, Helen, Geraldine. Thanks to Alice and thanks to Miranda for coming in. Thanks to um, Paul for 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 ending this on such an optimistic note. Uh, thank you all very much.